Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodman with Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's Streaming Only History's Lunch program. We are a little delayed by some technical issues, but I hope everyone will be able to find us on the current live stream. We are working safely from the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium here with the Skeleton Crew and the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Please tune in for next week's History is Lunch program when retired MDAH archivist Jim Pitts will present Turks, Indians, Spaniards, and a flight around the world, the lives and military careers of four Mississippians. Today, we are delighted to welcome Felder Rushing, who will present Over and Under the Fence, Historic Pass-Along Plants as Social Glue. Felder Rushing, a retired horticulture professor whose ancestors have been bringing plants into Mississippi since the 1770s, has written more than two dozen garden books, thousands of newspaper columns, and numerous articles in national magazines. The prolific garden lecturer is the longtime host of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's weekly Gestalt Gardener program. Today's program is made possible by our friends at the Mississippi Humanities Council as part of their Speakers Bureau, and we're grateful for their support. To learn more about that organization and the good work they do, visit mshumanities.org. Now, here's Felder Rushing. All right. This, uh, just want to let you know that I know not only talk the talk, but I walk the walk. Those are homemade fig preserves, and you cannot buy those any place. Ah. Sharing the sharing the wealth. But I'm not supposed to share this. No, it's just yeah. enough, right. just enough for you. Uh, anyway, I really appreciate the opportunity that the uh, Archives and History and also the Humanities Council for me to talk about what I love, and that's talk about plants. I want to mention right off the bat, though, it's not about horticulture. I'm a retired horticulturist, which is all about the rules and how-to and efficiency and all. I'm here to talk about gardening, which is right, Brandon, just for the love of it. And uh, there's a lot of love to share. I'm going to be talking about these kind of things over the next few minutes. So uh, let's just get started. Uh, what I st I'd like to show this picture of a... Uh, Garden, because the word garden comes from an old word, gordos, which means a guarded area. You feel special. You're in your own special place. But it can't exist without help from others and plants and lessons that we learn from others or, or we're taught by others. Uh, so the idea of, a, of walking into a place that's special, that's your own place, that is unique like anywhere on earth, that's what we're talking about today. Um, I would like to mention, though, these plants don't care who you are, who your mama and them are, where you're from, whether you vote or not. They don't care. Plants are just plants. And how we use them and how we share them is what creates this community of gardeners. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today, sharing the garden flame. It's a flame. It's not just what you buy. It's also what you share. The, the, and it's more than just the plants and the recipes. It's the folklore uh, and the history and the, the culture that goes along with it. Um, I write about gardening. I talk about gardening. I'm a professional garden journalist. Um, but I also study a lot. I belong to a lot of different organizations, including a Southern Garden History. Uh, just to show you a handful of the books that I use to learn about plants of the South. Now, I live in England part of the year, but in the South, we have our own culture, our own plants. We know what grows well here. We try stuff. Some of it work doesn't. Some of it doesn't. But these are the kind of plants that have been here for a long time for reasons. Uh, I have an article in this summer's issue uh, put out by the Southern Quarterly by the University of Southern Mississippi. Uh, and it's about this, about um, how people share plants. And I know I'm not supposed to read stuff, but I'm gonna, just the two paragraphs is not surprising. What's called the South, where habits and memories are long and ingrained, has been the most studied and written about region of the country. Yet, like with music and cuisine, our gardens have no single style or plant palette that defines it all. We're in a melting pot of ideas and customs adapted by diverse people struggling together to cope with a harsh climate, and we're still evolving. And that's what we're about here. So I'd like to share a few things that I've learned over a long uh, career of gardening, about studying gardening, horticulture. I um, would like to mention, though, again, I live in England part of the time, uh, partly because I've been here in the summertime. You know, I'm here because of the, the, the COVID-19. I'm not able to, to go visit the flower shows and all that in England. But I spent a lot of time over there uh, learning how people who have gardened for a long time garden. And they've worked out ways to garden in the most unbelievably harsh conditions. A lot of times they have walled gardens to keep the, the heat in. Because you got to remember, England's on the same latitude as Nova Scotia. So they have to find ways to grow plants in 
a somewhat harsh environment. This is one of my little gardens uh, over there. It's a little herb garden. I say herb with an H because it's got an H. But you see, I've, I've got rosemary, I've got peas, I've got oregano, my little gnome, and even a little miniature bottle tree. Something that reminds me that I'm from the southern part of the United States. Uh, I do see a lot of plants on my travels uh, that I, I wish we could grow lupins, wild lupins like they have over there, but we can't. So I don't bring things back from around the world that won't do here. I'm looking for things that enhance the quality of our lives. Uh, wherever I go, it doesn't matter where I'm, I'm at, when people find out I'm from Mississippi, they all know it. In Germany or Italy or France or England, being from Mississippi is cool. They think about things like our, 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 our music. You know, it's world famous. Also our cuisine. Here's a shot of my dad making some of his, his famous ribs. The culture of music and, and food is something that permeates our entire social uh, structure. Uh, I'm from the Delta originally, where people can get away with quirky stuff, like this lady who spray painted the numbers of her favorite NASCAR racers on her elephant ears. You know, NASCAR racers on an elephant ears. That's not quirky in the South. That's something we're sort of used to. Uh, day before yesterday, was it Tuesday? No, Tuesday, I went out and I picked figs under a crepe myrtle tree, and I made these fig preserves that, uh, that I... I the thing I'm pointing out, though, is the fact that figs and crepe myrtles and camellias and azaleas sort of symbolize the South, but they're not from here. They're not Southern. Figs are from Africa, crepe myrtles from Asia, but they've come to symbolize who we are, even though they're from other parts of the world. It's a melding pot, and we've learned to, adapt, to enjoy things that do well. My own little garden's kind of quirky from the street. It's not like other uh, yards in the neighborhood, but I don't have any grass to mow, but just want to show you a couple of ideas of how I garden. In my back garden, being from the Delta, I like to have memories of things like cypress tree and Spanish moss, so I have a little, what we call a stumpery, a uh, nice little splashy thing where I pile up stumps and Spanish moss, and it makes me feel like I'm back home in the deep south because that's, that's, that's where I'm from. Uh, I also grow vegetables on the side of my house, and uh, in this particular case, I've, I've got three classic vegetables, corn, beans, and squash. A nice combination from a horticultural point of view. They help each other they support. It's a synergistic thing. Uh, this combination has been grown for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's grown in uh, what's now Mexico. Uh, it's a combination that the Native Americans found out did well and produced well, uh, a, a complete diet, and they also helped each other horticulturally. So it's something I celebrate, not just because it's historic, but because it still works. It worked in, it still works. And I grow a lot of plants and unusual things. Uh, here's my, a, a little small truck. I've got a little toy truck with some, some plants in the back. And the reason I do that is because I'm thinking if anybody can do this, they can do better. You can do bigger. You can start out small like this and do like I did in my big truck, grow a bigger garden and a bigger truck. And I started this out just to, to show that there are plants that will grow in the most miserable conditions. 104 degrees in the summer, 15 degrees in the winter, 80 miles an hour according to the highway patrol. But I started doing this just to show that anybody can garden on a small scale, middle scale, or bigger scale. Heck, I even planted stuff in a pothole down at the bottom of my street. I live in a little town called Fondry, Mississippi, which is sort of stuck inside Jackson. But I planted stuff in a pothole just to find out what would do well in our harsh climate. I was raised by a horticulturist, my great-grandmother, Pearl Boyer. She was born in the 1880s. When I was 10 years old, she called me Little Professor. Uh, because I followed around the yard. She showed me a lot of cool stuff because I was interested in that. This is a picture of her about to give a presentation on going herbs to a garden club back in the 1940s. Uh, she used to write in her journals, this same journal that I've got right here, uh, in 1940. 14, she wrote about remembering going to her grandmother's garden and all the flowers that grew there, and she, she had stories associated with each one of them. Uh, she used to, re she remembered her mother uh, all dressed to, to ch go to church would carry flowers in, in her hand because we didn't have deodorant back then. You had to carry something that smelled good. But uh, she remembered this combination of the red roses and the wild tray scant to the spiderwort, uh, which I call the Rumpelstiltskin garden. And then this was a, an arrangement I made when my father passed away uh, some 15 years or so ago. It's a camellia flower. It's the paper white narcissus, so fragrant, and the berries of Nandina. And the reason I want to show you this, because these plants look okay in the flower arrangement. They look great in the garden together. But more important, every, plant, every, every flower in this arrangement 
came from my dad's garden. They were planted before my dad was born by his grandmother-in-law, my horticulture's great-grandmother. These plants have lived in the South, lived in the Mississippi for decades with no water, no sprays, no fertilizer, no horticulture. They were good plants. They were chosen. They were, and, and between all the garden club ladies and other people in the community, they found out what grows well here and how to put them together in what I call the Rumpelstiltskin effect, weaving golden garments from common straw. A lot of these plants have been shared among uh, people, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit, but here's the main three things about what makes a plant a good heirloom plant, something you can inherit or share with others. It's got to be valuable, pretty, tasty, flavorful, uh, durable, uh, you know, the historic, maybe it's uh, a family heirloom. Whatever gives a plant's value, and the more values the plant has, the more different kind of people are going to share it. Uh, durable, grows in just plain dirt, with or without water, no real serious problems with the insects or diseases. It can grow in a cemetery. Dead people can grow these things. So if it's valuable and durable, it will survive. But what makes it a pass along plant is easy to share. You can divide it, you can share seeds, you make cuttings, whatever. Uh, it sort of like reminds me of the old friendship uh, bread, the yeast that people share. You know, you get some of this, and friendship uh, bread is what they call it, where you share this yeast, and before you know it, everybody's making bread from something that people share. And yeast on a certain uh, botanical level isn't even a plant. Um, night blooming cereals. Chris, just the other night, you, invite, you put your night blooming cereals out on the curb and invited people in the neighborhood to come by and smell it and watch it unfold. It's been done for so long. My great grandmother did it. Eudora Welty did it. People have had uh, parties where they get together and watch this unique event purely for entertainment and pleasure. And when they leave, they almost always went with a little piece of the, the stem which roots like ringing a bell. So this is the kind of plant that you can't buy anywhere hardly by anywhere, but it's grown all over the South between people who realize the value and they share it with each other. And there's some others. Uh, I work with, with heirloom uh, groups uh, all across the country, California, Minnesota, and everybody's talking about heirlooms. And there's some benefits of growing heirlooms because they're interesting, they're unique, they get different flavors. Um, but I'm not growing plants just because they're heirlooms, just because they're old. I mean, we introduced plants 200 years ago that were miserable then and they're miserable now. So they're not necessarily plants that we grow because they're old. We grow them because they're valuable. Here's an example. Uh, I like hot peppers. I don't like big peppers. Well, this is a little chili pekin. I got it uh, decades ago uh, on a trip to Texas. It's native to Texas and, and Mexico. Tiny little thing, they will sit. I mean, you don't even need to think about any other kind of drug if you've got these kind of plants in your garden. They will light you up and they give that wonderful little endorphin uh, good feeling. Uh, I don't want to get too, too over-exuberant here. But these are the kind of plants that have been saved because they're pretty, they're tough, they're durable, and they help with digestion. Uh, also, things like okra. You know, okra, a lot of people don't realize a lot of these plants that we take for granted as southern plants are from overseas. Okra came from Africa. Uh, I've got a book that, 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 uh, where they studied all the different kind of plants that are used by early black Americans, slaves and freedmen, uh, that were grown by black Americans and share with other folks, with the whites, with the, with the Native Americans, because they grow well here and they had use. Uh, if I'm going to grow okra, I'm going to choose a variety that happens to be uh, burgundy, because I went to M Mississippi State. There you go. Maroon and white. But it's a pretty plant, and if I get tired of looking at it, I can eat it. But most important, it'll grow in Mississippi all summer with no care at all. Same thing with brown cotton. A lot of people don't realize, but cotton used to come in different colors, brown and green, uh, lavender. Uh, we bred it to be white to make it easier to dye blue jean color. But this is the kind of plant that's still grown by people, but you have to know somebody to get a piece of it, a seed to, to grow it yourself. I've seen it grown in, in, uh, in Jackson, Mississippi in ornamental gardens. A lot of our potted plants, a lot of our tropical potted plants came from South America, Asia, Africa. All of our mother-in-law tongue, the San Severas, those are African plants. And we have their mainstays in our gardens now because they are so durable indoors. Uh, some of the, the herbs that we grow, this is called yarrow. Yarrow uh, has been grown a long time. It kind of spreads. And it's not grown because 
it wasn't originally grown because it's pretty. It was introduced because the leaves could be used to stuff into wounds, cuts, and uh, soldiers would carry it to war in case it got hit by a hatchet or something. Uh, it was used as a way to stem the flow of blood in a, in a cut. And that's a weird thing, but people took it with them because that was before you could go out and buy Band-Aids. Same thing with this old white iris, introduced by the Spaniards uh, to what's now uh, the uh, southern, southeastern part of the United States. Uh, the Florida de leaf from France is patterned after this, but the roots of it Orus root are used as a herbal fixative. It was brought because it had herbal use. And we grow it now because it's pretty, it's obviously tough and durable because it grows in a cemetery, and it's easy to dig up and divide. It's the kind of plant you cannot buy this plant at most garden centers. They sell fancy irises, but everywhere you go, everywhere, it doesn't matter what neighborhood, country, urban, small town, you're going to find this plant, and every time you see it, they got it from somebody who got it from somebody who got it from somebody. And that connects us. When you see this, it's a badge of that social connection that gardeners have. Another of my favorites is old orange daylily. The only people who won't grow this are daylily society people. But this old orange daylily, Quanzo, uh, we put it, uh, I'm a board member of the American Horticulture Society, we put it in front of our sign because, first of all, it lets people know that horticulture isn't just about fancy plants. It's about comfort food plants. And that's what this is. Also, it's a quarter mile from our headquarters, and none of us are going to waddle down there and water it. And uh, plus, nobody's going to steal it. You either have it or you don't. But the thing about this, it is the single most commonly grown daylily on earth. Five continents. Big planting of it outside the Royal Botanic Garden at Kew. It's a popular plant. It's durable. Not going to win any awards at the flower show. But it's a great garden plant. And you see it all over the world. And get this, it doesn't grow from seed. Everyone you see came from someplace from someone that got it from someone that got it. It's been shared worldwide. And get this, it's been grown for over 3,000 years in Asia, not for the flower, but because it's edible. You, those buds are just as, you can roll them in a little, fla, a little uh, butter, put a little flour on them, and you've got a nutritious meal that has the same vitamins as broccoli. It's been grown for food for over 3,000 years, and a lot of people just look down their noses on it. Well, my great-grandmother, uh, when I was young, she had a field with uh, 350 different kinds of daffodils, named varieties of daffodils uh, in nice little rows. And a uh, decade after she passed away, I went out there and I looked at the ones that were still growing that didn't need to be divided or any of that stuff. And I got about two dozen different kinds of daffodils from her garden that were growing with no care at all. Those are the ones I want. Horticulturally, I'm interested in the 350 different kinds. But as a gardener, I want these. And these are the ones growing in my garden that came from my great-grandmother's garden planted in the 1930s before my dad was even born. And where do you find these plants today? Not at garden centers. you got to find around old home sites where everything is gone but the daffodils or somebody who used to live there who will share them with you. So these kind of plants uh, are our collective knowledge, our horticulture knowledge. Um, and when you see these uh, growing in, in old fields, you can tell there used to be a house there. We have a lot of bulbs like this, the old hardy gladiolus, the uh, red amaryllis. There's so many different kind of plants that fit in this category. Uh, red spider lily, you know, yeah, you can buy them, but you see them all over the south uh, where people are sharing with each other by just simply digging up the bulbs when, while they're blooming so you can still tell where they are. Uh, there's a chrysanthemum that I see all over the south. It's not the cushion mum, it's not the fancy mum, it's kind of a sprawly thing. This is called Clara Curtis. It's been grown in the south since the early 1940s. And everywhere I see it, country gardens, small towns, um, and it's not for sale. Uh, what's interesting though, if you, if you pay attention and look around, this is the most popular, but there are also different varieties. I see them in older neighborhoods, and I made it part of my professional legacy, I guess, to collect and propagate and put these different kinds of chrysanthemums, which bloom in the fall. You know, springtime is easy, summer is easy, but in the fall, when it's, our tongues are hanging out so hot and dry, these plants always come in their own without, uh, without any care at all. These are the kind of plants that we've collected, that we share with each other, and we continue to do that. Uh, roses, we see roses. This one called Mutabilis, the uh, butterfly rose. Uh, I see it all over the south. 
Uh, we have roses growing in the cemetery in downtown Jackson within sight of the state capitol that, ha that are so tough they don't need sprays, they don't need water, they don't need fertilizer. And uh, they were planted uh, by some master gardens and rosarians so that people could come out and see roses, America's floral emblem that are easy to grow, that we can enjoy, and that we can, can share with each other without a bunch of sprays. See, so we're still evolving. We're looking at the survivors from Grandmother's Garden. A uh, native plants is the old American beauty bear. It grows out in our woodlands. It's a great plant for wildlife. It's an interesting plant. But we have so many terrific plants that are native to Mississippi, to the southeast, that are commonly grown all over the world. I mean, everywhere I go, I see in all the flower shows, they have big displays of Spanish moss, which is all over the, the south. Uh, some of our insect eating plants, the, uh, the pitcher plant, Saracenia, these plants, and up at the top you might uh, see the, the sundew, these grow wild in the southeast United States and they're treasured. There's a whole entire plant societies around these kind of plants that grow wild in Mississippi. And of course, our Passiflora, the passion vine, uh, we see it carved on tombstones in Germany and England because it's such a fantastic represent representation of a uh, or has religious themes to it, but it's a tough, durable plant. Our native azaleas, not these, uh, th these uh, evergreens from, from uh, China and Japan, but the ones that drop the leaves in the winter, these grow wild in the south, and we don't have them in our gardens because we grow the ones from Asia. But you go any place in Japan or in England, you're going to find these wonderful plants native to Mississippi coloring up their gardens. Uh, when plant explorers first came to the south, they started finding this plant that has the largest flower in North America. It's a plant that's been grown for a long time. They've been painted since the 1700s. It's celebrated everywhere. You can hardly find an estate garden or a castle in England that doesn't have our magnolia grandiflora growing beside it. Uh, this is a, a, uh, a sculpture of a magnolia flower that's in the oldest botanic garden in Europe in the Netherlands. It's the only sculpture they've got of plants and it's our state flower. They love it. And every time my daughter, she's, she's grown now, she's in her 30s, but everywhere she goes the rest of her life, wherever she goes, anywhere in the world, even New York City, she can smell this thing and be transported back to her homeland because this is what it's from. Uh, we have a little ver dwarf variety. Matter of fact, I've got one right here. I, I don't know which camera can pick this up, but this is called Little Jim for people who think that a magnolia is too big. This is the dwarf magnolia. It fits... Oh, it smells so good. It fits well in our gardens. Uh, it's easier to grow. It blooms longer than any other magnolia, but it's still a magnolia. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, the Department of Archives and History has had this on our historic monuments since 1949. The Magnolia State has this on every historic monument. We're all familiar with it. It represents all of us. And I'm thinking, uh, I remember when it was on our, our, uh, our car tag one time. Wouldn't it be neat? if the State Flag Commission managed to find a flag that was acceptable for all Mississippians that had a magnolia flower on it. And I'm just saying, we're the magnolia state. Anyway, I grow a lot of these native plants in my own garden. Uh, this is a fall shot with the, the narrowly sunflower, the goldenrod, the wild azuratum. It's a nice combination. It grows well. It likes it here. Um, I found a, a, in England, I found a garden, a fancy garden, where they use our wildflowers and put a piece of split rail fence by it to make it look prettier, make it look, look a little bit more interesting, a focal point. And by the way, if you want to get away with growing wildflowers, what some people call weeds in your yard, uh, just put a piece of hard feature out there. It's a lesson I learned a long time ago. Had some wildflowers in my front yard, put a piece of split rail fence, made to cover Southern Living Magazine. And it wasn't just the wildflowers. It wasn't my horticultural skills. It wasn't their native plants. Uh, the fence, it was a combination that made it look so good. And get this, it looks like Mississippi. I think that's important. I started uh, working with this group called Slow Food out of Italy where they, they uh, celebrate uh, home cooking, local cuisine, uh, recipes that have been shared with each other, uh, you know, things, uh, home cooking. Wherever you are in the world, home cooking is important, and they call that slow food as, as opposed to fast food. Um, two weeks ago, I went to a local peach orchard up in Calhoun County, Mississippi, and I picked some peaches, and I brought them home and made a pie with them. You can't get more local than that. I know Chilton County, Alabama's got great peaches, but these were grown in Mississippi. And so when I ate those, I had some minerals from Mississippi into my system that became part of me. 
Uh, you know, wherever you go in the world, everybody's got their own version of comfort food. This, uh, the cornbread, the black-eyed peas with bacon, I might add. Uh, the tomatoes, the basil, all of these except for the, the cornbread were grown by my dad. You know, he grew it and cooked it himself. This is home cooking. This is comfort food to us in the South. Now, I want to emphasize that these plants are more than just objects. My great-grandmother had all these flower frogs for helping her flower arranging, and I've got a lot of them now. But only one person at a time can own these flower frogs because of physical possessions. But she also had a fig tree. She showed me how to pick figs. I helped her make fig preserves when I was a teenager. My children have picked figs and made fig preserves from their great-great-grandmother's fig tree. And that's important because... Uh, Unlike the flower frogs, every one of us can have a piece of that fig tree because it's easy to propagate. And by the way, my friends in Vermont talk about Vermont maple syrup, and they're so pleased with themselves. Vermont maple syrup, okay, whatever. You can buy, buy Vermont maple syrup at every Piggly Wiggly in Mississippi, but you got to know somebody, Chris, to get some homemade fig preserves because that's comfort food, and that's purely Southern. Uh, would like to mention, uh, take it down a, a notch, we grow stuff in just plain D-I-R-T, dirt. Master Gardener's soil is French for dirt, okay? Dirt is English for soil. Whether you call it soil or dirt, you can take it and grow stuff in it. Cotton farmers, soybean farmers, corn farmers have been growing in just plain D-I-R-T dirt for a long time. But how about this? You know, there's certain kinds of dirt, certain kinds of clay, that if you dig them, you dry them out, you cook them and put a little vinegar on them, they're nutritious too. A lot of people eat dirt. You think, well, I wouldn't eat dirt. Uh, salt is a mineral dug from the dirt. Kale pectate for an upset stomach, that's a, that's a clay, a slurry of clay. But all over the world, people have found that you can actually eat Certain kinds of dirt for health benefits. Don't want to get into it. I'm just saying that's we can get as, as far along those lines as you think. So I did this book called Slow Gardening about the way we garden, uh, about pass along plants, about the kind of plants that we share. Um, but I want to emphasize that it's not about being lazy. Folks, I can show you lazy. Lazy is not doing anything. And trust me, I've forgotten after 12 years of being overseas just how hot it gets here in Mississippi and humid in the summertime. And this is the way I choose to spend my afternoons. Um, but it's more about sitting in a swing, relaxing, cup of coffee, glass of wine, whatever you beverage of your the the beverage of the time of the day you sit out there you sit in a swing moving just fast enough to where the mosquitoes can't get you and you start hearing seeing heat lightning you hear the cicadas you see the lightning bugs the fireflies and this you talk about things you get away from people blowing themselves up on television sit on a swing and talk about life and that's part of the South. We're an outdoor culture. We enjoy sharing stuff. We enjoy spending time with each other. And we go slow. I have to, Chris, I have to tell people all the time, my northern friends, we're not slow in the South because we're stupid. We're slow because it's hot. We're in a stupor. And we just relax and take our time. I think we invented the word sachet. But it's, slow gardening is about doing what you want to do. I saw this sign outside a church in Port Gibson, Mississippi. <laughs> I'm not making this up. And I'm thinking, have they got nothing to say? I got nothing to say. And that's why horticulture, horticulture has all these rules. You got to do it this way and do it that way. And no, you don't. You don't have to do that. Uh, Sisyphus, the ancient king who thought he was smart and he insulted the gods by trying to outsmart them. They doomed him to roll this rock up the mountain. It would roll back down. Roll the rock up the mountain. Roll back down. Endless, ceaseless toil. That's horticulture. It's not gardening. Horticulture is... Uh, Digging around, knocking around the yard. You know, green thumb comes from getting it brown, stuck in, 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 the, in the dirt. Green thumb is not, a, it's not a set of skills. It's an attitude. If you can make a BLT sandwich, if you can slice the tomatoes so they don't squirt out the sides, if you know how much mayonnaise to put on without making your bread soggy, a little bit of salt and pepper, those are kind of skills that it takes for home cooking, same skills for home gardening. There's no real good recipe for, for homemade BLT or growing any of those things. Uh, I've seen rules like uh, the Rose Society people say you're supposed to prune a rose above an outward facing five leaflet leaf. I'm sorry, I get it. I know why they say that. But you can prune roses with cherry bombs and they're still going to bloom. It's not a rule for gardener. I'll give you another example. A lot of people don't like that when they see 
crepe myrtles cut back like this, and uh, they call it crepe murder. Uh, excuse me, this is, picture was taken at Colonial Williamsburg. It was done in the 1600s. It's been done for a long time as a way to keep the plants compact and sprouting out new growth that they can use to weave their fences with. It's called pollarding. Uh, at the American Horticulture Society headquarters, uh, we've got uh, a crepe myrtle that's being grown nice and stately and tall and straight, which is really good and all natural. We've got one that's been pruned back since 1918. Okay, both of them are horticulturally correct. So whether you like to prune them or not, let's don't, we got other stuff to argue about. Trust me, we can argue about anything. Let's don't argue about whether or not to prune crepe myrtles because it's taste making. My approach is, it's like rolling, rolling the toilet paper. The people who say you shouldn't do this to your crepe myrtle are the same kind of people who go to your house during a party, go into your bathroom and change the roll around. Shut up. Go home. It's just a style. Don't let it di divert you. Find and follow your bliss. Find and follow your bliss. Um, a lot of people may not recognize this. It's a, a, long, it's a group of long, skinny stolons, little runners with individual plants on it. Um, this plant came from Asia. It was discovered by Europe, introduced by Europeans because it grew flat on the ground. They found that if you grow enough of them flat enough and keep a mowed, you can have a lawn. Now, a lot of people love their lawns because it makes them feel like they've done something. I make up my bed every morning and I feel complete. I feel like I've done something. I'm okay because I made my bed up. Some people use their lawns to prove that they're okay to themselves or to their neighbors. That's not slow gardening. That's fast food gardening. Slow gardening will have a throw rug of grass instead of wall-to-wall -wall carpet. They use it as an element of design rather than a, a, a requirement to live in certain neighborhoods. Food, not lawns. Uh, let me throw this out. I've tried to grow tomatoes. This is my first year to plant tomatoes in over a dozen because I have a hard time with it. I have such a hard time growing tomatoes. And folks, I wrote the book. I can make your eyes bleed with detail about growing tomatoes. Uh, but the truth is, I'm not that good at it. So I know, but I plant them every year because it gives me hope. It gives me hope. And knowing that they may not make it to maturity the way I entertain it, as a slow gardener, is uh, I take my Sharpie pen out before the possums can get to it, before the worms can get to it, before the heat can get to it, and I put smiley faces on mine. That may be all I get, but that's what gardening is about. It gives me hope and a little bit of humor. Uh, it's like making sun tea. You've made sun tea, I, we all make sun tea, and you know it's really not that good. It's inconsistent. But when you make sun tea using solar energy, don't you feel a little bit smug, like maybe you're better than your neighbor somehow, because you participated in something that's part of our culture. Something as simple as that. Savor what you do. I could go in a lot of details, but let me just say that I put down my leaf, my leaf blower, I have a 128 mile an hour backpack leaf blower, and I put it down sometimes so I could go out and actually rake the leaves because I like the way it sounds, I like the way it feels, it involves me in my garden, and I don't do it all the time, but but I choose to do this because it's sort of like mowing the grass. It cleans the place up and I relax. Using simple tools where I'm the only moving part, I think that's a good way to go. Uh, Southerns also love to accessorize. You know, we're outdoors a lot. We tend to have uh, outdoor shows. Up north, you'll see gnomes in people's gardens. You know, you might find all sorts of stuff. But Southerns tend to accessorize just about everything, uh, whether it's your 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 vegetable garden, maybe you've got a saint. You know, I'm not Catholic, but this is Saint Fiocre. Uh, Fiocre is the official patron saint of gardeners. And not worshiping, it's sort of like looking at a picture of my kids. It reminds me of, uh, of my family. Having this saint out there, Fiocre, with his flowers and his shovel, it reminds us of the, since the ninth century, of people sharing herbs and flowers and food with each other. It's a reminder of, of, the, of the legacy we have, the obligation we have to share with others. Uh, you may want to have something fancy like this Victorian uh, uh, cast iron bird. It's nice. It looks nice. The garden would be nice without it, but it's nice. Trouble is, I can't afford it. It's expensive. It's an antique. So what am I going to do? Well, I use my grandmother's concrete chicken. I put it on a little plinth out back. Not my great-grandmother, my country grandmother, who only grew zinnias and monkey grass, striped monkey grass, and a concrete zinnia. So I put that out in my garden, and some people say, well, it's tacky. Sorry. When I see that, I don't think of a concrete chicken. I think of my grandmother and her zinnias. Nice little focal point that's better in scale with my garden than an eight-foot naked goddess would be. 
You know, you can, you can make any kind of sculpture. You can make a cow out of chicken wire if you want to. The idea is to just have something out there that personalizes your garden, that creates a focal point, that makes you feel good, that also maybe brings a smile to people's uh, faces. I think that's important. I will hasten to add, though, it is entirely possible to over-accessorize. Trust me on this. Uh, this is up in, in, uh, in the Delta in Leland, Mississippi. But there are total yard shows like this all over the world, Japan. Germany, everywhere I've gone, we see total yard shows. But I want to mention that these kind of folks tend to be happier and more relaxed than their neighbors. Their neighbors get irritated. These folks, it's not that they don't care. People say, well, you don't care what we think. It's not that we don't care. It just doesn't matter. We're relaxing and enjoying ourselves. Still, you can get a million dollars worth of embellishment out of a single well-placed urn. It's important to accessorize your garden. Now, I want to throw out one more accessory that's kind of unique to the South. I've seen these all over the world, literally on five continents. I've, I've taken pictures all over the place. So that's using glass as a garden ornament. Uh, this is a, a Dale Shahooli, a garden in Seattle, Washington. Uh, he's a world-famous glass sculptor. His work has been in every botanic garden all over the world, and it's nice. It's expensive, but I can't afford something like that. So if I want to have glass in my garden, what am I going to do? Well, you know, all, all you got to do is find some bodox seeds, uh, some, some, uh, some old wine bottles and put them out in your yard, something to smile. It's what they call poor man's stained glass. Uh, we see these all over the place. And I don't want to put a little plug for my neighborhood, Fondren in Jackson, Mississippi. The world's capital, there are more bottle trees in Fondren, Mississippi. It's only like a square mile, square and a half mile than anywhere on earth. I see them everywhere. I see them in the Chelsea Flower Show, but you ride, walk around, and a lot of people say, well, I don't like them because they're, they're a little bit tacky. And I'm thinking anybody who hangs stuff out of holes in their ears can basically just shut up. I mean, you hang stuff out of holes in your ears, we put bottles in our tree, same thing. I love, I love me some bottle trees. Here's a quote, though. This is from a, from a woman in England who does glass sculpture. She said, it's not about voodoo. It's not about poking your, your finger in people's eyes. All we're doing is holding glass up to the sky so its colors can sing. That's all we're doing. Pink flamingo people are all alike. They all think they're part of this tribe. We're not like everybody else, but we're sort of together. We're as different as everybody else in our group. Every single bottle tree person thinks they are the only bottle tree person because it is a truly unique. I'm not a tree hugger. Been there, tried that. It's okay. Some people really get into it. It's kind of rough to me. You know, crepe myrtle, smooth and muscular, you bet. Let's go with that. But at the same time, I think it's important for us to realize that we have an obligation to more than just ourselves and our beauty and food and, and sustenance. We have an obligation to help support the world. And that includes attracting wildlife to our gardens, whether it's uh, bees or butterflies. Uh, even the little native flies, this is a little fly. It looks like a yellow jacket. It's one of the most prolific pollinators. It was pollinating plants in Mississippi before Europeans introduced honeybees from Africa. This is a great native uh, pollinator. And if you don't have things like this, all you have to do is plant flowers. You plant flowers and butterflies and bees and the pollinating uh, flies and dragonflies eat them, and all this web of life will be attracted to your garden. I would like to mention, though, it's more than just pretty butterflies and stuff. I got possums in my yard. Uh, matter of fact, right now I've got uh, some baby possums that I've adopted. I'm trying to get them big enough to let them go. I leave them in my yard. They're not hurting me. They're not hurting anything. They do a lot less damage than my neighbor's squirrels and cats do. Uh, but wildlife is more than just the pretty stuff. It's the functioning stuff as well. So this is a lesson. Uh, I think it's important that we take responsibility for what we are and, and, and what we're doing. Now, the last part about this whole presentation, the plants are great, they're useful, there's ways to grow them that are either very easy or very difficult, there's so many techniques, there's so much culture, the history, uh, so much about what we do that creates this sense of place we call where we live, whether it's Mississippi or California or Japan or Nigeria, wherever you are, a sense of place. But these plants have to be easy to share. This is Master Gardeners when they were getting ready to plant those roses at the Greenwood Cemetery downtown Jackson. And every year they have a, a meeting where people can come to this cemetery and take cuttings, take them home with them and share with others. And it's easy. If you've ever played this game with a piece of string, 
You're the only moving part. Kids do it. They show it to each other. It's interesting. It spreads itself without YouTube videos all over the world. All children everywhere on earth can play these games with a piece of string. Gardening should be just as easy as that as well. Uh, we have plant swaps. This is in Florida, Mississippi. Oldest, uh, oldest plant swap that I know of the, in the known universe. Been going for a long time. Twice a year people get together and bring an incredible diversity of plants. Interesting people, interesting plants, mixing it up without having to pay dues or elect officers. It's an informal thing, and it's astounding, the kind of plants. Here's what I attended last year in Sheffield, England. Uh, they have a plant swap where people just bring plants and they share with each other. And it doesn't care who you are, who your mom and them are, and all that. And who are the people who do this? Who are the people who are keeping all this going? Some of you are. And we appreciate it. If you've got these plants in your garden, you're part of this, this uh, subgroup of sharing plants. You're part of the tapestry. Um, but there's a, some people out there who are not like everybody else. They may not fit in certain neighborhoods. Uh, can you tell which one of these gardeners is more likely a slow gardener? It's probably this one right here. They're a little bit out of sync, but they, their mailbox works just like everybody else. It's important for us to remember. Uh, here's a California garden. It's uh, got the white fence. It's got the white arbor. It's got the roses. Very nice, very tidy. Everybody gets that. Let me show you one I took in Jackson, Mississippi uh, about 15 years ago. The, 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 the woman passed away. The garden's torn down. Remember, white fence, white arbor, roses. That's in England. Excuse me. This is in California, done by professionals. Here's one in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, excuse me. White fence, white arbor, roses. Same technique, same style, same everything, different materials, found materials, things that, that people share with each other. We see these gardens all over the place in small towns, country gardens. They don't have grass. You know, we, we used to have flowers before we had lawn. We've only had lawnmowers in our great-grandparents generation we didn't have we had push mowers you know before we had so a lot of people grow flowers and they share stuff with neighbors these kind of gardeners are literally all over the world and you can tell them because typically and I call them diggers determined independent gardeners that phrase is coined by a fellow named Bill Timms in, in Laurel Mississippi determined independent gardeners Garden Maverick. You can tell one because a couple of things. One is they're going to always have a line of pots on their driveway full of plants waiting for a place to be planted. They always have this plant queue. It's sort of like plant purgatory. They're hoping they get planted before they die. So this is an opportunity for us to, uh, to, to see where people who share plants also get plants, even though they've already got more than enough. I'll tell you another way you can tell them. If you're riding around, these kind of diggers not just grow a lot of different kind of plants, but they're busy, and they're doing their own thing. They care what you think, but it doesn't matter. And you can spot a digger from half a block away because they always look like this. This is the way you see them because they're busy in their gardens. This is what they do. And uh, if you stop and talk, they'll... Stop what they're doing. They'll be glad to share a plant with you, uh, share some seeds, or talk with you. But they're typically out there minding their own business, collecting, growing, sharing, feeding that, that thing that's in them that's got to be fed. Uh, I'm sort of like that. I grow a lot of plants. This is my garden from the street. Um, my little garden near, near my shack in the back. I live in a little cabin in my backyard. I grow all different kind of plants and they all have stories. Uh, I used to have a, a co-host for my radio program on Mississippi Public Broadcasting named Dr. Dirt. He passed away several years ago. He was famous as a, as a, as a digger. Uh, his garden had something in bloom every single day of the year in Ebers, Mississippi. He didn't have a hose. He watered with rainwater he collected in buckets. Uh, he didn't use herbicides. He didn't use chemicals. He had plants that he gathered all of his life from all over. And he welcomed everybody. People used to come and visit him all the time and share plants with me. Well, every week when he would come in to do the program, every single Friday morning, he brought a bouquet of flowers he cut that day from his garden to show that you can have stuff in Mississippi all year long, regardless of the weather. I think that was really important. Uh, got a book coming out in the spring about these folks. Dr. Dirt, other determined independent gardeners, uh, put out by Mississippi, uh, University of Mississippi Press, be out in, in January. Uh, let me show you just a handful of, uh, of, of diggers. This is Rick Griffin, landscape architect, top graduate of Mississippi State, lives in a community that has a gate with a guard. 
you got to go through a guard to get to his place. But you go in his backyard, it looks like this. It looks like Dr. Dirt's yard because he's a digger. He lives in a fancy neighborhood, but you go in his backyard, his private sanctum, he's a digger. He lines his, his flower beds with bottles. He has a bottle tree in his yard. And this is a upscale neighborhood, as upscale as it gets. Uh, there's another lady who lives a few blocks from me who has a lot of stuff in her garden. Her name is uh, 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 Susie. And she's known as the birdhouse lady. She has about 140 or something birdhouses in the yard. Everybody loves her. She's nice, um, but she's a digger. She's not like other folks in the neighborhood. Uh, two streets over, Jenny Nelson. She's from Jamaica, a retired nurse. This is what her garden looks like from the street. And she, there's Jenny with some of her flowers she, she cut last fall. And wherever you, you go, she's got these wonderful uh, connect, collections of plants that she got from people who got from people who got from people. Uh, next to last one I want to show, this is a, a, a fellow named, uh, James, uh, named David Perry. David Perry's garden looks like a digger, sort of like a garden club. The important thing about him is when I met him, I wasn't expecting this. He said, Felder, do I look like I'm supposed to be doing this kind of thing? He said, I'm not supposed to be doing this, but it's in me. It's got to come out. And then the last one I want to mention is our friend Jesse Yancey. He lives in a, a, a kind of a tight little neighborhood called Bellhaven. Some people like his garden, some people don't. But he gardens on a street corner that he doesn't even own. This is what it looked like. He lives in an apartment across the street, and he got permission from the owner to dig up and plant a few little flowers. I think he put a birdhouse, a, a bird bath, and a couple of things. Before you know it, he took this corner and turned it into this. And it's a unbelievable collection of heirloom plants, pass along plants, shared plants, plants he got from others he shared with each other. There's something in bloom or that he can eat every week of the year. Every single week of the year he can do that. Um, and it's always something, always something out there. Incredible. But the most important thing is he shares with his neighbors. Now this is the way to get past the tastemakers in his neighborhood. He shares flowers with their children. Because it's a community. He's teaching them more about gardening than they will learn anywhere else because grandmama ain't doing it anymore. See, so this is the kind of, of, uh, kind of a milieu that we have. I call these keepers, no, sharers of the flame. And they've been doing it for a long time. Uh, my mother, when my daughter was born, my mother would wiggle her fingers down in the dirt and show my daughter how to, to, to pick up good pecans, sharing that, keep, keeping that wealth. Uh, and again, it doesn't matter who you are, these plants don't care. They are the universal language, better than food, better than music, better than anything else. These are a common language that we all share. I think it's real important that we remember that. By the way, I didn't know I was going to grow up to be this way. I, did, um, I remember my mother used to tell me, when somebody gave me a plant, don't thank them for it. You, instead of saying, thank you for this plant, you're supposed to say, mama told me not to thank you for this or won't grow. And people say, that's right. So we decided the best way to thank somebody for a pass-along plant is share a piece with somebody else. So if you'd like a little bit more information, I'm on the Gestalt Garden, Mississippi Public Broadcasting every Friday and Saturday. I'm in uh, the weekly and daily newspapers around the state. Uh, but you can also read about this stuff at not, not an internet, not, not a website. It's Felderrushing.com. Dot blog. It's got things about Dr. Dirt and all these other folks. I appreciate the opportunity that, that the Humanities Council uh, provided for the Department of Archives and History to let me share with y'all. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions by any chance? Do we, we have do. Time to we have questions? several questions and comments from the live feed. Um, one from Teresa Baker Passmore, a very specific question here. What would be good to plant? on a cradle grave of a child that died in 1869. It has a concrete base and is not very deep. Yeah, you're talking about these little small graves that have a little, uh, little like a concrete wall around them. Uh, you want to have something, first of all, that, that doesn't have to be mowed, doesn't have to be sprayed, doesn't have to be really taken care of. And I can't think of anything more appropriate than some of these early daffodils. They come up, mm -hmm. there's some really good ones, they're fragrant, and you can choose some to bloom over a long time. They come up, they bloom in the wintertime, and when the mowing crews come by, they're out of the way. So that's my first choice. Some of those little irises would do well, uh, maybe even a little small rose, but something mm -hmm. like these kind of plants. I'm thinking daffodils, uh, small rose, or maybe some of those little irises. Savina Schoenhofer uh, asks, where is the headquarters of the American Horticulture Society? Uh, the question, that where is the headquarters of the American Horticulture Society? It's right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, it's, in, it's in Virginia. 
Alexandria, Virginia. It's right on the, it's in one of George Washington's old farms uh, called River Farm, right on the Potomac River just south of Washington, D.C., about six mile drive south of the, the airport in, in uh, uh, Virginia. I'm going to share a comment before I get to the next question. Uh, Janine, I wish y'all could smell this. I wish y'all could smell this. <laughs> Janine Brown says, Thank you. I've always been afraid of gardening because of all the rules. <laughs> I have to see, people ask me my advice about things. I'm thinking, have you seen my yard? You want my advice? <laughs> I garden like that. And by the way, let me, let me mention this. When I give presentations in New England or California or England, I use a phrase, old lady flowers. Mm -hmm. And that's not politically correct, but in the South, old lady flowers is not an age or a gender thing. It's a style. Excuse me, it's a style. Right. Uh, question here, what is your favorite use of plants or plant stories in historical writing? Are you familiar with any diaries or daily records of everyday gardeners in Mississippi history? You got one in your hand. Well, matter of fact, this is one that my great grandmother wrote in 1914 of what grew in her grandmother's garden. But there's a lot of this kind. Of, there's a group called the, the, uh, the Southern Garden History Society. And there's some books I showed in one of my slides that are full of plants. That, that, and their descriptions are taken from diaries and from descriptions of early, uh, early explorers. So there's plenty of that. The Southern Garden History Society. And if you email me, I can send you a list of a couple of really good reference books uh, on that topic. Southern Garden History Society, uh, of which we have number of members here in Mississippi, can help a lot with that. I'd be glad to also. Kimberly Bell Carver asks, is there a listing of organized plant swaps in Mississippi anywhere online? Ah, is there a list of any organized plant swaps? There's only two organized plant swaps that I know I go to every year. One is at the Flora Library, Flora, Mississippi. Uh, it's in April and, and October, and they, they announce it ahead of time. Uh, and then there's one I go to in Mobile, Alabama, uh, that they have twice a year. But as far as a list of them, I don't know of any. Don't know of any. But it's easy to do one yourself. You can do it yourself. Just get neighbors together. Bring a plant. Mm -hmm. Tell a story. Swap them up. It's not hard. It's not complicated. It's like horticulture. You can make it more complicated than it needs to be. But uh, anyway, um, my radio program, the Gestalt Garden on MPB, mm -hmm. I talk about these every time before they come up. Diane Williams asks, uh, I have a third floor screened in sun porch facing east. I would like to, here in Jackson, I would love to have a few tall plants. What would you suggest? Email me. Too much stuff to say today. <laughs> Trust me on this. And by the way, um, MPB, Mississippi Public Broadcasting, you can email through uh, garden at mpbonline.org. Or just go to my blog, but I can help you. Easy. We don't have time to talk about that much good stuff. I would like to, any, any questions from anybody in the audience? Nope. Any questions? They say, they wake up. <laughs> we had a question actually about uh, someone asking if you still have your truck. Was it stolen? My truck got stolen several years ago. It was recovered, uh, repainted by the by the Votech guys up at Holmes Community College, <laughs> painted John Deere green. I showed a picture of it earlier. That picture was taken two weeks ago. Okay. I drive my, my, that garden has been through 36 states. I go thousands of miles a year with a garden in the back. Mm -hmm. But yes, I do. And then uh, the question was, have you seen changes in people's gardening with the pandemic? Yes, I, I do a lot of walking. I live in a, a, a sort of a mid, you know, just a, a working class and mid, a mixed neighborhood. And I'm seeing more little raised beds and containers in people's front, not their backyard, their front yard, mm -hmm. like as a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. People are planting little raised beds and stuff in their front yard to let people know I'm still here and I'm trying. Don't know what I'm doing. It may or may not work, but I'm here and I'm trying. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think one well, last... I, I, my, well, I made fig preserves the other day. I went to the supermarket. I had to go to four places to find canning supplies. So people are buying. So people are putting stuff up like they haven't before. They're out of supplies, for, and the garden centers have sold out of plants and seeds and seed starting kits this year. They've never done that before. Hmm. So yes. Someone had asked if there are other cemeteries across the state that you know of, similar to Greenwood Cemetery here in Jackson, where there are 
roses yes. that are cultivated for. I, I don't, you know, the, the, the Friendship Cemetery in Columbus, I think, has some, but most cemeteries are going to have some irises. Now, I'm talking about older garden park type cemeteries, not the new mow and blow type stuff. Most small town cemeteries will have a crepe myrtle, a, a magnolia, a cedar tree, some daffodils, some things like that, as long as it doesn't interfere with the mowing. Mm. But if they hire a mow and blow crew, plants are gone. We had to put little metal bars around the, uh, the Rosie Greenwood Cemetery to keep the, the, the string trimmer people from hitting them all. Right. But it wouldn't be a great idea to start up a little small corner of your cemetery in your town, a little small corner. And you go to, to Europe, all the botanic, all the cemeteries have got little garden areas. And it'd be neat to have one. Maybe the garden clubs or master gardeners could do one. That's a great idea. Uh, a question here about the current state of pollinators that there had been, uh, I guess. Uh, yes, uh, poll pollinators are a big, yeah, there's, there's a big problem with the bees and things like that. But if you're in an urban area and plant a lot of stuff, you're still going to find dragonflies and bees. And if you were to create a little area in your garden where there's just a brush pile, a stack of wood, some old logs and some weeds and stuff around it, that's where a lot of these pollinators spend the winter. So you can, if you don't have any, you can start some. I really appreciate the opportunity. This has been a whole lot of fun, y'all. This has been great, Felder. Thank you so much. Appreciate you all for watching. Tuning in, uh, we'll have this up on the department's YouTube channel soon. You can watch it, of course, anytime on Facebook after this. And uh, please join us next week for Jim Pitts with his interesting talk on um, four really significant and overlooked Mississippians from the early part of the 20th century um, that you won't find anywhere else. Thank you to our friends in the Humanities Council for making this possible today. Felder, thank you so much. Enjoy the fig preserves. Yeah.